sitting around you are some wonderful people. Now, I, I'm not going to preach real long uh, I, I, because, you know George Burns? How many of you remember George Burns? You young people know George Burns? You are uneducated and you need to be educated. Get online. Don't do it while I'm preaching. Look up George Burns. Don't smoke cigars like he did, though. But anyway... He said, for a successful sermon, he said the secret of a good sermon is to have a good beginning, a good ending, and to put the two as close together as possible. So that's what I'm going to try to do. But you know, when I preach, I want people to know Jesus. And if you're not ready to go to heaven and you, you know, you go, what if I were to have an accident and die, and you're not ready to go to heaven, then you need to get ready. And I want to preach Jesus because he's the only way that can get you there and of surrendering your life to him and accepting his great gift. But also, I want, to, I want spiritual development. I don't, where are you in your spiritual journey? Where are you in your spiritual maturity? I ask you, where are you? Are you growing? Do you desire to grow? Do you want to fellowship with God? Do you want to get to where you can hear his voice, be led by the Spirit, empowered by him, be used of God? Sir, well, let me just share with you. If you today can live without caffeine, if you can be cheerful, ignoring your aches and pains, if you can rest Resist, rather, complaining. If you can understand and be okay when your loved ones are just a little bit too busy to give you any time or attention. If you can take criticism and blame without resentment. If you can ignore a friend's limited education and never correct him or her. And if you can resist treating a rich friend better than a poor friend. If you can face the world without lies and deceit if you can conquer tension without medical help, if you can relax without liquor, if you can sleep without the aid of drugs, if you can honestly say that deep in your heart you have no prejudice, no prejudice against creed, color, religion, gender preference, or politics, then you've almost reached the same level of spiritual development as your dog. <laughs> a dog does all of that. <laughs> How many of you feeling built up? <laughs> Woo, pastor's encouraging us today, baby. Oh yeah, you know what someone said to me? He said, just put your wife and your dog in the trunk for an hour and then open it up and see who's happy to see you. <laughs> Hey, Pastor Bunhead there, Marin's got to look like you better not try it, so I advise you not to do that, brother. Don't do it. Well, I, I felt led. I really, really, I really prayed because 26th anniversary is a big deal. I, I was so scared when I started the church, you know, and, and um, I remember that second Sunday we had 37, uh, the third Sunday we had 43, <laughs> that fourth Sunday we had 32, and boy, I was depressed. And... Uh, but we had people get saved every Sunday for about eight years. And, and then now most weeks, somebody's saved in somewhere, and we're glad for that. And, and, and we, we just want to say thanks to God and we're going to give God the glory. And, you know, when I prayed about it, and I just felt really impressed to preach a sermon called To God Be the Glory. And then the passage in 1 Corinthians that says, the last verse of 1 Corinthians 1 that says that no flesh would boast only in the Lord Jesus Christ, only in God, that the, all the glory and boasting to God. And I knew that was the passage. This is in my heart. It was the heart in the beginning. But when I did that, I, I was later that week, and I don't remember what day it was. I think it was Thursday. It was Thursday, I believe. I was driving down the road here, and Randy Kraft was right out there messing with flowers. But I was noticing how our yard looks not like grass. It looks like a carpet because it's too perfect to be grass. And all these volunteers, because it's all done by all these people that give and clean. I thought, I started, you know, my mind can race really fast. You ever notice how I talk about four things at once that don't make any sense? Anybody ever notice that? <laughs> but my mind was just racing, like going <laughs> like that. And I'm, I was thinking about all these people, all your faces are going. I was thinking about people that serve in the nursery and uh, that clean and pray and the people that are, that minister and, and, and volunteer and help with, you name it. I mean, they help with communion to, to, uh, with the children, with the youth, with the college ministry, with all kinds of things, teach. I mean, we have people that do, like Don Newsom, he'll fix anything, and if he can't fix it, he'll mess it up, but he'll try anyway. And 
<laughs> I don't know if you hear Don, but I love you. I was just kidding. And, uh, but people just serve in just so many different capacities. It's uh, blowing blow me away. And so my mind was just going, whoop, 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 whoop. And I saw Randy out there. So when I got back to the office, I just texted him and said, hey, Randy, I saw you serving. Thank you. He texted me back. Thanks. And this is the exact words. To God be the glory. That hit me because I knew that was God saying, you're preaching the right thing, brother. And I had two or three other people respond to me this week with those same words. Today when I say to God be the glory, now I may say it, it's, I'm very confusing to follow, so I might say it when I don't want you to do it because I might just say it not realizing it's time to do it. But I, when I say it emphatically like, to God be the glory, I want you to go, thank you, Jesus, praise God, or praise the Lord. Can we try it? Here we go. To God be the glory. There we go. We got them all. The first service, they all said, praise God. Not one of them said, thank you, Jesus. I said, do you know Jesus? <laughs> There's God the Father, Jesus the Son, our Savior. <laughs> so, hey, I know I don't usually do this, but I want to declare in this service, it's all about God. It's all about Jesus. I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. So we turn here, and we're going to read the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And my first point is to God be the glory for Jesus Christ our Lord who is faithful, verses 4 to 9 of 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. I want to stop there and say, you don't know how many times I thank God for you. But I'm thanking God for you because of what God has done in you and for the grace of Jesus Christ and I know Paul's heart as a spiritual father, as someone who watches over like a shepherd, a sheep, and all pastors, true pastors, and not church leaders, not church uh, administrator type people, but pastors who care about their sheep, they have this heart, thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Verse five, for in him, in Jesus, you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Verse six says this. It says, I preach Jesus, him crucified and risen from the dead. I preach the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you are a testimony that what I preach and the power of the cross is real because look at your heart, look how you've been changed, look at your life, look what God is doing. Look and listen to the speech because of the grace given to you. I'll read that verse again, verse six, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you and therefore, because of what Christ has done, therefore, why is it there? Because of what I just said, what, what Paul just said about his grace, and the confirmation of the power of the gospel to change a person. Therefore, because you've been changed by that gospel, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. You know what I believe about that? I believe that God gives certain gifts to people. He uses people. He ministers through people. But you know what? If you're the only person available and willing to be used of God in a situation where God wants to help someone, if you'll listen and be willing, no matter what the gifting is, it will flow through you to somebody because God loves the person that he wants to reach. And he has chosen to partner with us and flow through us as human vessels by his spirit with his word and truth to minister to someone. And I want you to have confidence that God loves loves you. He'll use you. Don't be afraid when you're put in a situation where you need to see God do something big for someone. Believe it. You're the one there, and God will flow through you. The gifts are available, and His Spirit will work in you. And I've seen it many times, people working for the kingdom of God. Also, he goes on, and he says uh, in verse 8, he says, well, let me read seven again. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you'll be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God is able to complete that which we have com committed to him until that day. He's able to complete it. He's able to keep you. You see, Paul wasn't responsible to keep the people of, that he had led and was overseeing from slipping away. It's God. 
He uses us to encourage. The Bible says encourage one another, exhort one another, love one another, prefer one another, teach, teach the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. But let me tell you something. It is God that will keep you till the end. And you know, a lot of people don't stay in the end because probably, honestly, I may sound a little Calvinistic here, but just listen to me. A lot of people never get saved. They just get religious. They never have the power of grace change their heart. They never really have the Holy Spirit confront their heart and come in and change their heart. You see, you and I both, we're all born with a desperate, wicked heart, a sinful heart. And the power of God and the grace of God comes in and captures our heart and changes our heart and turns our will to God's will. No longer my will, but God's will. Denying yourself, taking up your cross to follow Jesus. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Tonight I'm preaching on the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of this world. And I'm going to come from it from the angle of it changes your perspective on everything. I hope you'll come back and hear me preach. But I want to, I want to, I want to tell you that you have, you have not encountered the Spirit of God to come into your life and change your heart, then you need that. Because it's not just a person can believe this whole book and have it right, even have the theology interpreted correctly. A person can understand the definition of grace and all the terminology of mercy, of faith, and all of that. They can understand the plan of salvation, but Jesus by his spirit is the one you are born again of the spirit. It's he that comes. And let me tell you something. The Bible says that no man can come to Christ except the spirit draw you. And if the Holy Spirit draws you to Jesus, don't reject him because it is he that will take you and cause your birth to be brand new, born Born of the Spirit, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Spiritually new inside. And God does that. And I say, because God has saved me, God has changed my heart, because his grace, the power of his grace, has come in and changed my desire to be his desire and give me the power of his Spirit and the power of his grace to live it out. I say, to God be the glory. Amen? To God be the glory. Praise God. Eh, y'all did pretty good. <laughs> and the last thing in this first part, look at this. Give God the credit because God has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is faithful. So the first point is this. To God be the glory because God is faithful. He is faithful in Jesus Christ. And he's called you into fellowship. You know what fellowship with Jesus is? It's that friendship. It's that knowing, learning to hear his voice, walking with him and talking with him. He opens up. And in the early church, when the Holy Spirit was moving, they had miracles all around. They gathered together regularly and fellowshiped. You know, we talk about fellowship, and it's usually soup. If it's only food, it's not good enough. Yet food was a part of the early church, and it's important. But I want you to tell you, fellowships are spiritual things. Listen to me, because the Bible says hospitality is one of the highest marks of a spirituality. Do you know that? To be hospital, open your home, have people over. That's why these home groups are so important. Let me tell you something. When there's opportunities for fellowship, like Friday night, when people were beating each other with dodgeballs, and the young adult, they were killing each other and knocking each other over, that's spiritual. <laughs> Did you get hit, Pastor Zach? Because you look like something's messed up with you, man. <laughs> they must have mauled you good, buddy. He loves me. He loves me not. <laughs> second thing, to God be the glory for the unity of the mind and thought. Second, take a second thing, for the unity in mind and thought. We go on and we pick up reading in verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. There it is. Perfectly in mind, united in mind and thought. My brothers some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Is Chloe here? Chloe, this is your household. And it says, verse 12, what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Paulus. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? That's what Paul's saying. He's one writing this. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, 
so no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Now, Paul's a little bit like me. He suddenly remembers, maybe I'd baptize a few more. He says, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Let me just tell you, I, I've buried a lot of people. I've married a lot of people, and I've baptized a lot of people, and I really don't remember. So when you come up and say, you remember marrying me? And I go, uh, uh. I really don't. Just confession, I probably don't. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. I want you to see that we want to give God the glory for the unity we've enjoyed for 26 years, the unity in mind and thought. You see, unity is not agreement. In fact, it's healthy for to debate scripture and theology, and the, if you disagree, so what? I mean, let, me, let me share with you something. If you're Calvinistic, I don't really care. If you're going to go to heaven, you got that much confidence, get on up there. Okay? If you're pre, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, just so you're tribbed up, you're ready to go, Jesus is going to come, you're going to go to heaven or hell, just know it's okay. You know, just remember this, I'm always right and you're always wrong, but it's okay. <laughs> that, a little bit of humor. I'm going to teach what I believe, and I'm going to argue the point, and you can argue the point, but that doesn't mean disunity, because the unity is not in correct or perfect theology. The unity is in Jesus Christ. It's in the gospel. What is the gospel? That Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he went to the cross and died for our sins. He was buried on the third day. He rose again, and this same Jesus that was, had victory over death, hell, and the grave has given it to you, and by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, he'll come inside you, and you who are dead in your sin, headed for a devil's hell, you can be forgiven and raised up to new life. That's what Jesus Christ does every time. And when he does it, who gets the credit? Not the preacher that delivered the word, but God. To God be the glory, all the glory. Amen. Now, we are just servants. We're just vessels. This is not my church. I prayed in the beginning that I didn't want it did it be about me? And Jesus showed me, I said, how can I do that? Because I had enough history to know that many people who start churches, when they get old and die, like, you know, I'm not dying, don't take that wrong, okay? Well, I don't know, I don't think, no, I'm alive, baby, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna be like Enoch, I'm going up, baby, I'm not going down. He's gonna take me away. When I disappear, it won't be aliens, it'll be Jesus, okay? So I'm just saying. But anyway, you know, I prayed, I don't want this to be about me because, you know, when the guy that starts the church kind of gets out of the way, then sometimes it's a problem because there, pe- people have a tendency to follow people. There's a problem. Remember Paul, who was mightily used to God, God gave him a thorn in the flesh so he wouldn't get the big head. Remember that? And he prayed three times, but God didn't take it away. Why? Because he didn't want it to be about Paul. I don't have that much problem. That's why he hadn't given me any thorns in the flesh. He just made me ugly. That's, that's, that's what, how God kept me down, you know. Thank you for that. (laughs) Yeah. Somebody says, yeah, that's right, brother. Preach it. (laughs) But I was praying and God said, I'll tell you how you, how you, you emphasize that the church is, is the people and own the people. We say we come into the house of God. This is the place of worship. We are a living house of God. We're the temple of God, right? But listen, here's how the Lord said, just give everybody keys because keys represent ownership. And, and also, just have them clean the church because people clean their own houses. And uh, so I do that. Now, some people have been pressuring me because we got zillions of keys out there. Okay. Anybody want a key that doesn't have a key? You want a key? Jenna wants a key, Luke. Get Jenna a key. Anybody else want a key? Jeannie wants a key. These pastor's wives don't have keys. What are you doing? Are you kidding me? You don't have a key? Is she Doris right now? She has a whole stack of keys. I don't know. And they want me to go to these keypads so we can change them. I went, until the Holy Spirit tells me a keypad equals physical key, I'm not going to be doing it. So when I'm dead, go ahead and change the keypads. Because I want you to always remember, this is the Lord Jesus Christ Church. You belong to him, and you individually with that one and that one, that one, we make up the body of Christ. I don't own it. I'm just one person. I'm no important than you are. I have responsibility different, but we all are important in the kingdom of God, and God uses all of us. Some are called to one thing, some are another, but God will use his church as a whole, and our job is to equip the saints as pastors for the working of the ministry, according to Paul's book in Ephesians. 
would equip you to do the work, and we come alongside you, and we work together and serve the Lord. About five years ago, the Holy Spirit said, now you got to quit preaching all the time because it's going to take a while to transition people, not be dependent on your weird personality. He said, you got a bunch of weird people that come to your church, and they like your weirdness. I said, I know they're weird, but they love you, Jesus. He said, yeah, but you got to get other people that are normal to preach. So I said... I said, okay, so we started doing that little by little, little by little, little by little. I knew what I was doing because I was following the Holy Spirit. You here with me? Are you with me? All right, now most of you like it because you realize people can preach better than me. Hmm? Yeah, stop that amen, and that's a bad time to amen right there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, you know, so I'll just say like Paul says there in his verses, uh, it's not about Don, it's not about, about, about Pastor Jeff, it's not about Weaver, it's not about Brad, it's not about... Uh, Austin, it's not about um, Pastor Bunhead over there, and it's not about Pastor Pretty Boy Luke, and it's not about the smart and beautiful women pastors who are amazing and fantastic, and it's not about you, it's about Jesus. It's about God who gave his son, always. In fact, I didn't even know how to read hardly. I had a first grade that was a drunk, and I was behind, I was a bad student because I didn't learn how to read in the first grade. True story, I don't have time to tell it. It's a really great story, I should tell it. No, I'm not gonna tell it. But anyway, I cried in class because I didn't know the alphabet in second grade. My teacher was drunk half the time in the first grade, nobody knew it. He, she let us sleep on rugs most of the day. We didn't learn anything in first grade. My parents sent me on because they thought it emotionally messed me up if I was stayed back in first grade because I didn't know how to read. Well, anyway, the Lord healed me, long story short. He healed me my senior year in high school, and now I can look at a paragraph and read it just like that. And you wouldn't think so the way I preach, but I can. <laughs> and I want you to know that, that you're talking about in this passage that he takes the weak to confound the wise. He takes, he just, it's not about us. I'm telling you, it's about God because God's the one in the, Satan wants quarrels and divisions anywhere he can. And when we follow men and we try to lift men up, you're going to end up with conflict. So I want to thank God for the, for the unity that's in Christ. See, Pastor Jeff has worked with me as co-pastor now for several years. In February, our leadership team has decided to put him up to vote to be co-pastor in our annual meeting, first Sunday of February. And when he's voted that, what that means, and everybody will understand, is that if I were to kill over dead, we don't have to find a pastor. He's pastor, just like I am. He's our next pastor. Now, we already work that way together. And in doing that, it doesn't mean I'm going anywhere because I don't believe in preachers, like, you know, getting lazy or something like that. And, and I, I love people, so that's kind of my hobby. So what else would I do? So I'm going to keep on a pastor and everything like that. But, um, but if something were to happen to me, He's, he, you don't have to vote as a pastor. And, you know, I said to Pastor Jeff, Jeff Pastor Jeff said to me, rather, he said, well, Pastor Weaver, I, I mean, I'm willing, I, I'm willing to do it, but I don't want your job. And I said, well, I don't want it either. <laughs> so, he, I mean, you know, but, but there you go. So we work together, you know, and uh, if you didn't like this sermon, come back because Pastor uh, Jeff's preaching next week and Pastor Don the next week, and they're better than me, and, and you'll like it, and they're a little more normal, and you'll enjoy everything. To God be the glory for the unity that we've enjoyed here. It's been beautiful unity in his spirit, in mind, in mind, and in thoughts. Meaning, the way we look at things, our mindset is, is not selfish. You see, if you as a leader have an agenda, then you're going to cause create conflict. When you think, well, God told me this and we're going to do it come hell or high water, you're going to cause a problem. And no person in a church should have an agenda. And you know what we don't do here? First off, I never wanted to build attendance, so I'll tell you the truth. And if you're causing problems by gossip, I'm going to confront it because I'm not about attendance. I don't even know how many people exactly are in attendance. Kind of estimate because I can look at the empty holes and know what it sees. But let me tell you something. We're not, we're not here to build buildings our, our denomination. We're here to build people in the church of Christ in you. And so confronting with love, truth, helps us all, doesn't it? And that's what you're to do to me. And you've done it. I talk, talked about it last week. We're to help each other. But the thing of it is, in a public meeting, you don't wait. Something's bugging you, and all of a sudden, at the annual meeting or somewhere else, you go, hey, I want to ask about this. Why don't we do this? What about this? What about that? You know, 
I mean, come on. A church is relational. We're multi-generational intentionally because we love the babies and we love the old people, right? We sang stuff that old people didn't like this morning and we sang stuff that young people didn't like this morning. Get over it. If you want an old church, sing all old music. If you don't like old people, you're not biblical. You're selfish. It's okay. I don't care whether you like it or not. We're going to do it anyway. Now, that wasn't the good spirit, was it? (laughs) Anyway, I just want you to know something. You can't have your personal agenda and and come in and start complaining. We're relational. Just come and talk to somebody. You see something that's not right or could be better from your perspective, just come and share. That's the way we do it. You don't let it fester and build up and then throw a tantrum in front because it's safe in a crowd like, oh, I got something I want to bring up. Yeah, Brother Smith, what do you want to bring up? Well, I just got to tell you, I just don't like it when you get up there and you slobber and preach. I think Pastor Hawkins ought to be preaching more because he's dignified and every word he preaches is exactly from the Bible. And you just kind of go all over everywhere, Weaver. I go, Brother, you're right. Exactly. That's exactly what I do. And I'm here to make him look good. Thank God. You just know that I'm the gift from God. (laughs) This is the weirdest sermon I've ever preached. (laughs) <laughs> uh, we speak to each other with love and truth and we're relational I thank God for the unity contend for the unity of the faith Paul says over and over in every letter be in one mind, be of accord and be peacemakers what Jesus said so let's continue to fight for unity because it's a beautiful thing the thing that draws people here is love L-O-V-E one little boy was going to church going all the way across town He'd run right by 15 other churches, this little church on the other side of town. They said, well, what makes you walk by all these other churches? He said, man, they know how to love a guy over there. They know how to love a brother over there. They, they really know how to love, and that's what it's about. The last thing is short but sweet. To God be the glory for the wisdom and power of God. It's not, my, not by might or power, but by the Spirit of God. It's God's power and God's victory. The next passage starts with verse 18 in 1 Corinthians 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. We have all these people running around, done all this studying and all this stuff, and they have all this stuff they're going to say to defute the Word of God because they're a bunch of brains. They may, may be brain in their head, but they're dumb in their spirit. If you argue with this book, I don't care how much study you've done of secular education, if it's the opposite of this book, guess what? You're wrong. The book is right. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. You realize how foolish it is to think, you know, hey, we're going to change people. Everything's going to happen. All you got to do is get up and preach about a guy died on the cross over 2,000 years ago. Tell him about he died and he rose again. Preach that cross. Tell him about how he suffered. Tell him about the blood that was shed. Tell him about how sin can be saved. Just preach that stuff. And man, that'll change the world. Sounds foolish to an educated person. But if you're educated this morning and you're watching online, just let me tell you something. Try it once. Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Put your faith in Jesus. Ask him to come in your heart and change your heart and save you. Because you might find out something. You might find out that the power of God will flood your soul and change your heart forever, brother, your sister. I want to know that I want you to know that this power of the cross is a real power. And it's what we stand for as a church. And our mission, our vision rather is heaven. And that's all that God cares about. He gave his son so that no one would perish. It's not his will that any perish. The devil is meant for hell. That's what he's made for. God never made hell for people. In fact, he did everything he could by giving his son to keep you out of there. And I want you to know this cross should never be taken down because it reminds us it's about Jesus. It's about the cross of Jesus. It's about the preaching of the cross of God because it's the power and the wisdom of God. And it says no one else should boast. To God be the glory. All the glory. Praise God. God. Verse 23, Jews demand miracles. A lot of people just want a miracle. They don't want Jesus. They don't want sacrifice. They just want miracles. Show me a miracle. There are people that like to get hyped up and get a miracle all the time, but they don't want to follow Jesus. I believe in miracles. Don't get me wrong. The Greeks are looking for wisdom. Oh, philosophize with me. Talk to me about the deeper things of life and all of the wisdom of this world. 
But Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews, and it's total foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think, think of what you were when you were called not many of you, I mean, look around right now as I read. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you influential when Jesus caught you. Not many of you were noble birth. I know I wasn't. I'm some messed up, curled up, weird little skinny Texas boy from Waco that couldn't read in second grade. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this, of this world and, and the, the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. You see, even your salvation, everything that God has done, you are nothing without Jesus. He's, he's the one that gets the credit to change you, to give you the right thought, to help you understand truth in the word of God. It's Jesus. It is because, verse 30, of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom, the wisdom from God. who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, look at this, God, Christ is our righteousness, the holiness and redemption are being bought back with the blood of Jesus. Therefore it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, to God be all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Can I hear it? To God be all the glory. Will you bow your head with me? You're here and you say, well, I'm not sure I'm ready to go to heaven. If I were to die, I, I wouldn't make heaven for you. The Holy Spirit is whispering that to you. He's not whispering to condemn you, but offer you life. If you've been whispered to that, hey, I need to do something about my heart, he's not doing that to put you down. He's offering you forgiveness of sin. He's offering to come into your heart and change you. And if you hear this morning, if you hear this morning and you need Jesus to forgive you and change your heart so that you would desire his will, you hunger for God, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just lift your hand and say, here I am, pray for me. Please close your eyes, everyone, to respect the neighbors around you, anyone. Yes, I see you, sir. Anybody else? Jesus, forgive my sin. I see you. And Jesus, forgive my sin. I want to make it right. God's going to do it. Yes, sir. I see you. I see you. I see you. Yes, I see you. Amen. I see you over here to my left. I see you in the back. Jesus is here to set you free and cleanse you. You may have been church. You may know about God. You may know about the Bible. But I want you to know there's an encounter of the power and the wisdom of God by his cross through Jesus Christ will come in and change your heart. And he's here to change you even now. Will you pray with me, Father? Father God, we believe Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and rose again. Died for my sins, and he's alive forevermore. Come into our heart and change it. Help me desire you, God. Help me quit being selfish and quit being weak. Come in with your power, not only to give me a new desire in my heart, but the power to live it out. Come in, God. Let me fellowship with you, walk with you. Let me be used of you. Let me find my full purpose and meaning, Jesus. And let me have confidence that you are willing today to forgive every sin and cleanse me. I thank you, God, and I give you glory, God. Come right now, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.